go. Three, two, one. Let's go. Oh, wow. We are back to Starbucks again Hell because yeah. it's my favorite coffee. Hell Much yeah, Much stronger baby. than the previous one. And it's a dark roast. We always fucking go back to Starbucks. This one's also one of my favorites. Yeah. French dark roast. We told you guys is the only way. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another fucking episode of Bad Decisions Coffee Break. Farad, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I'm super excited for today's episode yeah. because I think this episode is going to be one of the best that we ever had. Oh my God. I'm so excited for it. It's, it's something we've been thinking about. We've been planning. Um, it was supposed to happen yesterday, so we had like loads of questions ready. Um, and, and, and we will talk about that in a second. But what we actually ended up doing yesterday, we were actually checking out Luma AI. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have checked out the video. So the, the fact that you can now go on the website, upload a video from within a game or, or a video of something that you do in your real life and then turn that into a 3D model. We've been playing around with that for like the past couple of days. It's been crazy because we took the 3D model now that Luma AI created. We, we created a cinematic scene. We took it into augmented reality. The, the video we uploaded on our social. So if you guys want to check it out, make yeah. sure to check out our social media platforms for that video as well. Yeah, and, and the last thing we're going to try, they have a plugin for Unreal Engine. So you can bring in the nerf into Unreal Engine. Haven't tried that out. We'll try it out and then let you guys know how that goes. But, but Faraz, do you want to tell us yeah. who we have today as our guest? Okay, yeah. You know, you, you, you already know I cannot <laughs> fucking wait to get into this. We're not going to waste any more time. Usually we like to banter a little bit, but let's just get it straight into this shit. Um, the guest that we have here today is not just an award-winning motion graphics artist with nearly two decades of experience in television, film, games, and all that. He's... Probably the buffest dude in the CG industry, and there's no denying that. You've probably seen the videos on Instagram and Twitter. But aside from that, he's your favorite Unreal Engine tutor. And if all of that doesn't ring a bell, all you need is a Shaka sign and two words, and that's, what up, what, what up? up? We got Wimbush here in the house. What's up, Wimbush? What up, What's what up? up? Appreciate you guys. How you guys? <laughs> it's been a long time coming, yeah? <laughs> yeah man it's been a while we're just so grateful to have you here and to hear that what up what up it's you know it's it's, it's <laughs> fucking crazy because i feel like you've established that so anywhere anybody hears that what, what, up, what, up, up? what up we know it's it's been bushes it's, there so <laughs> it's crazy because i just got back from nab in vegas yesterday and um i had no presentations or anything set up this year like this is the first year i've actually gone to the convention it was just there to just hang out and chill and see some stuff. And everywhere I walked, all I heard was, what up, what up? And I'm just turning around and it's happening like every five minutes. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy. Like, you know, I definitely appreciate it. It lets me know people are watching the content, which I really oh, appreciate. Oh, for sure. Because, yeah. You know, my camera is here against the wall. When I'm doing tutorials, I'm literally talking to the wall. So you have no idea who's watching on the other end. So always appreciate it to meet everybody out there at these different shows and stuff it's great and but can you tell us where did that what up what up yeah, what's the about? story yeah, behind that like honestly like okay so when i was first in motion graphics like i was working at like happy madison and sony and warner brothers and most of the time all the artists are in a bullpen right and so yeah. everybody's able to communicate we're showing each other stuff that we're discovering tips and techniques and once I started my own studio here, Wimbush Immersive, um, basically a solo artist, right? Like my company is myself. I no longer have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and everything. So that's when I started doing YouTube to share the tips and tricks that I was learning out there. And when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. Like I was terrified to even put this stuff up online, but you know, people were like, hey, you should be doing this. And um, I think I was trying to figure out a good way to introduce myself whenever I come, you know, first with the tutorials and stuff. And out of nowhere, just like, what up, what up, randomly <laughs> just popped in my head. And I think I did it once and I, I hated it and I forgot to edit it out when I was <laughs> it. Oh Yeah, like people were just start, like people started commenting and then the thing like, what up, what up in all different languages and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, now I'm onto something here. So. It kind of just spawned by accident, but you know, definitely glad that it happened because it's become I, I, a signature that people just it's a enjoy. You know? now. 
It's yeah. definitely it a trademark. Yeah. Like Farhad trademark. said, like I think the, you've established it, and now if you don't start a video with that, it's gonna be a weird <laughs> video. Everyone, like I'm, everybody I'm not like gonna the, watch that no, video. No, everybody in the comment would yeah. be like, "Is is everything okay? Is, is that okay? AI? Like <laughs> is that an AI generated <laughs> video? Probably because that's not Winbush, man. That's not him. So <laughs> I I think. Sorry, please go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say it was funny because um last year at NAB I spoke at uh one of the booths and I introduced myself without the what up and somebody in the audience is like do the thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> do the thing you came here to do. <laughs> we we, we yeah. came here to watch that. We came here to watch that live. Oh my god! It's like right. I didn't come here to watch anything. I just wanted to hear you say what a what a bimbush here and I, I was I had to actually leave. But no, it's 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 amazing. Like you, I think. A happy accident, of course, but the fact that yeah. you made that a thing, I genuinely believe that is psychologically one of the best things you can do to establish yourself. We are definitely missing that. Oh, for sure. We need to. What would you recommend we should do? Should we, like, do you have any recommendations as to an intro we can do that people can stick with? Like, you probably have some ideas. <laughs> You're like the master at this, right? <laughs> Oh, man, I'd have to think about it. I mean, you guys have so much energy when I see your stuff on TikTok and stuff. It's like your energy is enough. So I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll collaborate. We'll think about it. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll think about that. For, yeah, I like that. I like that. And feast. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, but, <laughs> All right, we got to prepare that. 100%. Yeah. But beside the what our Wimbush is here, I think there is a consistent contents of you working out all over social media yeah and that is something that is attached to your personal brand and i think it's a great way to be recognized in all the platforms so now i know that yeah. you know i'm connected more to vin bush because i can see him working out we have something in common yeah where like where does that drive for working out comes from and i'll you know posting about it like because yeah. it's it, not very common in the yeah, cg industry sure. that's why i think we wanted to ask this question yeah, I mean, I was actually nervous about because I put the video out on YouTube first, just talking about like my fitness journey of where I wanted to go at the beginning of the year, because during the pandemic, you know, like all the gyms were closed. Not a lot of people were getting out of the house and I, even myself included, like I noticed a lot of people were gaining weight during this lockdown. It's like mm. it was either the one extreme or the other, right? Like people got extremely buff and ripped to the core during the lockdown or they got extremely overweight. Like nobody seemed yeah. to stay the same. But um, the thing that really hit home for me was like, you know, we're in our mid 30s, early 40s. And, you know, a lot of us are fairly still young. And I had a lot of colleagues having heart attacks. They were having strokes oh, no. while working. And it, it's a scary spot, right? Like we're still young and we're having these mm -hmm. health problems that we shouldn't be having. So mm -hmm. that kind of put the fire under my butt. And I wanted to put myself out there just to kind of be a catalyst for you're not alone type thing. And mm -hmm. I'm going to expose myself and, you know, put myself out there and show you guys that I'm staying consistent. And even if it only helps out one person, at least, you know, it's helping somebody out there. But it was um like you guys said, it was I was nervous because when I first started posting videos, especially on Instagram, I lost a lot of followers. I lost like a thousand followers because people are DMing me saying like, are you a motion graphics artist or are you a fitness instructor now? And, you know, there was a lot of hate coming along with it, but like genuinely I was just trying to help people out there. And mm -hmm. even if you don't want to work out, at least do something to just better yourself because mm -hmm. we're coming out of a really dark age. And I feel like people need to take this stuff more serious. No, I, 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 I got to say one thing. I, I encourage you to keep doing that. And we're big fans of the videos you're putting out, even the workout videos, because it's, it's normal. I think it always happens. If you look at singers as well, when they change a genre of their music, yeah. they tend to lose followers. But what actually happens in the long term, if they keep doing it, they'll actually gain a much bigger audience. because and more in-depth. Like yeah, you're more way in more connected to your audience now. And I want to thank you for really posting this because when people see that, they'll say, oh, Winbush is doing this video tutorial. He's doing Unreal Engine. Yeah. He's working out too. So maybe I, I can, can do, do that. Too. Yeah. yeah, I can do it too. And yeah. also at the same time, <clears throat> I feel like the people who are hating, they... They're coming from, unfortunately, probably a negative side of life themselves. And I, 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 right. I sympathize and I empathize with them. But generally speaking, you can be a motion graphics artist and still work out. You can be a motion graphics yeah. artist and yeah. post about cooking. Like, that's the beautiful part. If you look at anybody who's actually huge on social media, they actually do multiple things. And, yeah. and, and that's the beauty because we're humans, right? We don't just do one thing. And the people who truly follow Winbush... 
will follow you because they would like to see everything that you do because you yep. motivate them and you inspire them. So we're we're very happy that you decided to post those videos and we will continue to watch and support because <laughs> we're gym, we're big gym yeah. guys ourselves. We're definitely not oh, as much you? as you. Yeah. Not well, I mean, see, that was wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Are you judging this, man? Come on, man. We should, we should put, we should put some, but okay, what's your favorite body part when you are working out? I I saw that you are doing great bench press, lats. Yeah, probably shoulders, just because they, for some reason, my shoulders get defined first. Like, yeah. I would love to say abs, but they always come in last, right? <laughs> it's like, it's going to be a while before I see abs again. But the crazy part was just at this past convention, like running into people, a lot of people are like, hey, Wimbush, when are you hitting the gym? So I'm like, shoot, mm -hmm. we'll hit it 930 MGM Grand and everybody want to show up and I don't know if you guys seen the pictures, but there's a, a lot of motion graphics artists actually showed up to the gym to work out with me and stuff. And a lot of them are pretty diesel, too. So it's it's cool to see, you know, like more motion graphics artists and CG artists coming out of their shell, like their workout buffs. But mm -hmm. they were, you know, scared to kind of show that side of themselves. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think the more of us out there just, you know, at least preaching some type of health and fitness, I think the better the community is for it. I absolutely agree with you. And I'm, I'm glad to see more people are joining in. But speaking of Las Vegas, you just came from Las Vegas, I believe, yesterday. How was yeah. the show? You went to NAB, you went to NAP, and, and there's so many new upcoming technologies that they, they showcased there, one of which I saw um, uh, posted about Disguise and, and Move AI. But I want to I hear it from you. Yes. What was the most exciting thing that you saw? I was going to say probably the Move AI stuff. Like I actually oh. went over there, met Neil from the, the UK team at Move AI, very cool guy. But they just formed a partnership with this company called Disguise, which I have never heard of before. But what they were doing was they had a giant camera on the crane that was connected to Unreal Engine, right? So you're doing the camera parallaxing, you know, like the Mandalorian VFX stuff. But they added Move AI to that. So they had cameras all along the trace up top. And so a person could walk up on stage and control their avatar in real time. So it's not like how when I was doing Move AI, you know, you do your motion capture, then you upload it to the cloud, it processes it, and then you bring it into like iClone or Cinema or Unreal or whatever. Like the Move AI tech now is all real time. So that was pretty crazy to see the avatars moving with the camera and there's people up on stage interacting. Like it, it's pretty wild to see like everything starting to synergize together. It's 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 fascinating how fast the technology is growing though cuz you meant you just mentioned like when you were doing Move AI but that video that you did I believe about Move AI was just a couple weeks or a couple of months ago it's not even that yeah, far like Move AI like is a not ago. There you go. Yeah. It's it's crazy to see like how fast like I mean everything in the world of AI has been moving fast so I genuinely think anything in VFX and CG attached to AI right now is just growing at the speed of light. How yes, good yes. was the tech though when you saw it yourself? Was it is it something that you can see like happen very like soon the the real time motion capture or is it still you know in the process? Yeah, I, I don't think they're gonna bring it to the public right away. I think it's still maybe like a month or two off. But like you said, this stuff is moving at a breakneck speed. So I can see like the bigger companies utilizing it first, like your big TV stations, especially like for sports and maybe um new stations and things like that but I, it's only a matter of time before like it's going to get into our hands so mm. yeah this stuff is it's tough to keep up with especially everything regarding ai like i was expecting to see a lot more ai at nab but i think mm. it's moving so fast that they were scared to show a lot of it like <laughs> oh last year, you know like virtual production was the big thing last year right and it's like at nab this year there was a lot of virtual production. So it seems like the show's like a year behind. So I'm thinking like next year, it, everybody's going to be in the AI, but who knows where we're going to be at in a year's time, you know? Yeah, I, I can't wait to see that. And and there's so much to look forward to, especially in mocap. And hopefully if you have time at the end of the podcast today, we even go back and talk about mocap because that's one of our favorite areas to focus on. But I think we yeah. want to talk about some other stuff as well. Yeah, I think uh, you have posted a video on YouTube recently where that 
you explain why you left Warner Brothers 11 years ago. That was such a fascinating and inspiring story for whoever hasn't watched this, the video, please go to Winbush YouTube and watch it. He basically explained why he left Warner Brothers and how he became a solo entrepreneur, joining, uh, basically going through his journey. Mm -hmm. I think right. when you left Warner Brothers, of course, uh, many years ago, you knew that you had the technical skills that you know now you can do things on your own. But what about the non-technical skills? How, because in, when you were in Warner Brothers, someone was doing your marketing, someone was doing your sales, someone was doing your accounting, all the skills that a person who wants to leave their corporate job probably wouldn't have as a technical guy. How did you right. face those challenges and how did you overcome it? Yeah, a lot of mistakes were made, right? <laughs> on, on the we want to you know. hear. We want to hear all of them, by the way. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell us some of the like the biggest ones, the ones that stood out the most to you and were the most challenging. Yeah, like, um, well, you know, a lot of people know I'm here in the United States, so the tax thing was probably the biggest hurdle, like the tax and finance, because mm -hmm. before that, you know, I work at studios. I was a freelancer. And a lot of that stuff really, like you would just see the tax guy at the end of the year, right? And they would yeah. handle it. But once you become a business, the tax category gets so much more complicated. And I made a lot of mistakes with, you know, like trademarking my business and like signing up as an LLC opposed to an S Corp. And the first time I did taxes as a business, I got wiped out by the government. Like they, I guess it's because of how I classified my business. They just took a big percentage of my earnings and everything that year so from that point wow. i was like okay i need to sit down with a tax person and really figure out what i'm doing wrong because i can't take this type of hit every year or else there is no point in having my own business and so mm -hmm. i would say for anybody looking to venture out i'm not sure what the tax laws are in other countries but i would definitely make sure your finances are good before you really dive head first into it because that's the type of thing that really bites you in the butt but yeah just as artists it's like we think that we're good because we could do the art part of it but the business side that's a whole nother beast in itself and so mm -hmm. i know a person um even told me they said i should at least go to like the local community college and just take like one class in business management because that's just going to help you really wrap your head around the stuff that you really don't think about so did you did you end up doing that or or were you taking maybe courses online or advice from friends cuz the business side of things as well is something that is very important how do you deal with clients of course you were already uh, according to your video getting clients yeah. outside of Warner Bros when you were working back at home at night yeah. but of course going on your own now all you're relying on are those clients and you know you have to sort of have that balance of negotiations how did you deal with those and i'm sure clients were sometimes maybe you know, you have good and bad clients, right? So sometimes maybe Pushy they were pressuring you. Yeah. How do you deal with that? How did you learn how to get better deals and get, you know, your side of the deal and make sure it's a win, win, win for you, essentially? Yeah, so that's another, it was a hard lesson. Like at first, you know, when you're out on your own, like you said, all your income relies on the work that you bring in. And mm -hmm. so for the first couple of years, I was actually scared to say no to anything that came in, no matter how crappy the project is, right? And so... I was burning myself out a lot. I was taking on too many um, clients at once. And there's a lot of bad clients in there too. And so what I started to do was I started to hang out with a lot of my clients a lot more, just in like social settings, like going to watch like the UFC fights or watch the basketball games and just really getting to know a lot of people if they were local. And a lot of those clients ended up just turning into like really good friends. And then the ones that were just bad clients, at some point I had to make a decision like, do I want to live happy and healthy or do I want to just keep taking these bad clients that are stressing you out? So I took a financial hit maybe for like a year or two because I wanted to focus only on the good clients. But once I really hunkered down and focused on those clients that made me happy and we had a good business relationship, word of mouth kind of gets around and they'll suggest you for other people because the industry is smaller than a lot of people think like these producers they all talk to each other showrunners and stuff like that so mm -hmm. it took a little bit to build so i would just say you know like if it is something that people want to pursue it's going to take a little bit of time you're not going to hit a home run right off the bat but those relationships are definitely vital to you know you keeping your clientele and keeping yourself happy as well mm -hmm. 
That's an amazing lesson for yeah. anyone who wants to start their own journey because I think the lesson that you learn when you're starting on your own is not about only, like it's in every single aspect of the business. You will learn how to talk to people, how to do project management, you have to do your accounting, marketing, everything. So yeah. do you say now that after, I would say 11 years, you have mastered all these skills or you, you think you're still learning as we are going now? Definitely not. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm the type of person I just it, there's, it's always a learning process, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a good grasp of what works for me. I could probably do definitely better, but you know, this everything's been working for me. And then especially doing the social media, which I know you guys, I, I see you all over TikTok and stuff. So that's stuff that like I have YouTube, but I need to get better at the marketing on like TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So there's always more that could be done. And especially when I first started, we didn't have like these large social media platforms like, okay. you know, um, Twitter was around, but it wasn't used like it is today. It was more just a place where people just, you know, tweeted their thoughts and stuff like that. Like it really wasn't used for business. Um, you know, YouTube was around, but same thing. It was all like silly cat videos and, you know, the epic fails. It's always the cat like videos, so, man. It's always the yeah, cat so, videos. <laughs> I feel like there's, there's more that could be done on social media. So it's always tough when people are saying like, hey, if you would start out today, how would you do it? Because like when I started out, the landscape was way different than it is today. And I feel mm -hmm. like there's a lot more tools to utilize today. So I know that the youth definitely have that aspect of it on lock right now. Okay, you, you brought something up, uh, and I, I got to touch on that. Given the wisdom that you have now, after all these years of experience in the VFX and CG industry, if you were to start all over again from scratch uh, with yeah. no education in, in the industry, and, and let's pretend no money, because I know a lot of people watching <clears throat> this, potentially they, they, they're just starting out, so money is a big problem as well. How would yes. you go about things? And I, I want you to sort of cover everything in terms of what softwares would you even start with? Would you go for a formal education or would you just start watching Winbush on YouTube? How would you recommend yeah. <clears throat> yourself, the young Winbush, all over again to start? Yeah, I would say for me personally, because I went to a traditional four-year college to get my bachelor's degree. Um, mm -hmm. If I have today what i had back then i would have probably did it online like i'm a self-learner right so i felt like i could have probably learned the software through tutorials and forums and things that i like and skip traditional college i know i don't want to like tell people that's the right route to do because some people learn better in a classroom setting like my kids they're they're not really self-starters like that like they they thrive better when they're around the teachers and they like, ask questions and they're around other students and so i would say like for me I'm good online. I would um, utilize the different schools like School of Motion online. They have some pretty good courses over there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my stuff on YouTube, of course. <laughs> shameless plug, just a little and... shameless plug in there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a wealth of stuff. Even like you were asking about the softwares you would learn. Like I would, number one, like I know I'm known for Unreal Engine, but I can't stress it enough. Like if you're a beginner, and you're looking for work, there is so much Unreal Engine work out there right now, especially for designers that I'm getting hit up even by Epic Games. So like these studios are hitting them up looking for artists and they just can't find them because the talent pool is not out there. Like there's a large amount of people in the gaming talent pool that use Unreal, but they're mm -hmm. not really designers. They're more technical people, right? And so you have mm -hmm. studios like ILM and and Zoic and Perception, like these top tier places that are doing the big stuff you see in movies and stuff, they're yeah. looking for Unreal artists. And so I tell people all the time, like, if you know Unreal, even at a beginner level, there's there's a whole plethora of work out there for you. So I would say Unreal Engine, number one. Okay. Number two, I'm probably going to get crap for this because <laughs> I don't even know it myself, but I can't ignore Blender, right? Like, oh, wow. yes. I was waiting. <laughs> okay, I was, was waiting for that. The whole, we're just yes, going okay. to clip that part and put it on TikTok be like, Wimbush uh, said let me tell, Blender. Let me tell Wimbush what happened yesterday. So we were having a whole conversation over an hour of your decision between Blender and Cinema 4D. Yeah. And I knew you came from a Cinema 4D background and you started learning yeah. Blender with your kids. I mean, even other softwares, like yeah. Cinema 4D is the latest one, but he, he started with even you know other softwares before that. So it's been like a whole plethora yeah. of softwares, right? But You are please. feeling so proud now yeah, and happy. Man, I'm I sorry. <laughs> but continue, continue. No, no, I think it's great that I think if Winbush bringing it up, that Blender and Unreal Engine, I think there is a 
lot of value for those who want to enter to really get into these two software. Of course, they always yeah. can expand, but you know, they start with this software, get their skills up, and you yeah. know, they can easily find jobs. Hundred percent. Do you recommend? So we saw on Twitter that you 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 did mention that you are trying to learn Blender because your kids are learning Blender, and that's yes. because you know the community, like their friends, are all learning Blender. So do you recommend people to? Just straight away go to Blender and then do Unreal next, or just straight away go to Unreal or learn both at the same time. Well, what is your recommendation over there? I want to get your thoughts. Yeah, I would say both at the same time because they do mm. two different things. Like I love the real time aspect of Unreal, just even in the viewport and of course like the rendering and the interaction and stuff. But Unreal, you can't do everything on its own. Like you do need a separate DCC, whether that's Blender, Maya, Cinema 4D, 3D Max, Houdini. Like you do need something to complement it. And so I would say learning them in tandem might be the most ideal situation. But I would like to elaborate on the Blender thing because like you guys said, my kids, they have access to everything through me, right? Like I can mm -hmm. get them Maya, Cinema That's 4D. like the, the most fun, <laughs> I think like- if, They're bragging if, at school yeah, like nobody like-, like, like Wimbush <laughs> is my dad, by the way, just saying like, I get access <laughs> to all 3D software. It's like, you know, we got everything. But, that's the craziest thing, right? Like, at my son, he actually took, like, um, EJ. Shout out to EJ. He's the 3D director of School of Motion. Like, he yep. took his base camp class for Cinema 4D. His stuff and is amazing. When I, when I went to check on my son, he was in Blender. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you have access to Cinema. Like, I got you your own license. And he's just like, this is what all my friends in school are using. And all my favorite YouTubers are using this. And this is everything that I'm seeing. So it's kind of crazy that generational gap because when I was coming up, Cinema 4D was looked down upon as a toy. You know, like when I first started working in the industry, mm. we had 3D Max was huge, Lightwave is huge. And here I am, a Cinema 4D user, and people are like, what is Cinema? Like that thing is, <laughs> that, that thing's a toy. Like no one's ever going to take it serious. And then fast forward, now it's a big part of the industry. But now Blender is in that spot where everybody's like looking at Blender like, oh, that thing isn't, no one takes it serious. It's free. It's just for hobbyists and this and that. But I've been seeing it being used in some professional things. Like um, there's some video games at Bethesda that I follow mm -hmm. a lot of artists on ArtStation and they've been using Blender to make the video mm -hmm. game assets. There's been a couple of Netflix series, the full CG ones that will be used to Blender. So it's definitely slowly starting to make its way in there. And I see in the next couple of years, I could definitely see it being a force to reckon with. So uh, very like loads of stuff that you said there that we have to talk about right now. First of all, just an example. It's like when you were talking about your kids, it's like if I was at school and my dad was like, you should play Call of Duty. Like here, I got you Call of Duty and all my friends are playing Roblox. I'm probably going to end up playing Roblox, right? Like That's what it's happened just... to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, really? Is Did that exactly... No, absolutely. Like my kids, they're the ones that actually got me into Roblox. I didn't know what it was before. My daughter's up there playing like role playing games and all types of stuff. And wow. I'm like, I got, you know, when systems first drop, I'm the first one to get it. Like I got the Xbox mm -hmm. Series X and, you know, day one adopter. And I'm like, yo, we're going to load up. We're going to get Call of Duty. We're going to get all types <laughs> of crazy stuff. And look at these graphics. Look how crazy they are. My daughter's like, no, I'll just play Roblox. I'm like, oh. And I'm looking at it. And I'm just like, this thing looks like graphics from when I was a kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I didn't understand it. But just playing it with her, now I do. Because it's almost like. It's almost like playing with Legos, right? Like these kids mm -hmm. are built in their own ecosystem yeah. and then they're yeah. able to play them in a gamified way, which is really cool. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's very, I learned a lot from my kids to say the least. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely a topic that, again, we're going to cover Unreal Engine, uh, Fortnite Editor, which is exactly why this podcast mm -hmm. is even happening because that's the conversation we were having with uh, Jonathan on, on Instagram. But we'll get to that in a bit. Now, going back to Blender, I'm going to be asking the Sentry the question of the century. Do you think Blender is industry standard right now as of 2023? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely do. Like, I don't even like the term industry standard because I Why come up in, I'm in a class of, I use whatever works for that particular job. Like, I know I actually posted the other day that I was installing Maya 2024 because I'm working mm -hmm. on a project right now 
that required that because the client gave me assets that were built in Maya. So it's like, okay, mm. I guess I'm doing this in Maya. So, <laughs> <laughs> now it's like, it's I, like I, fuck, I, I got to learn the whole thing all over again just for this project. But that's the thing. Like I tell people, like once you know 3D and the basics of it, like, you know, lighting, compositing, um, mm. camera work and stuff like that, like that stuff, that knowledge translates through no matter app, what, um, no matter what application you're using. And so mm. their interface is going to be different. The way that it works is different, but there's a whole bunch of internet um, stuff on YouTube, like tutorials and stuff. So it's pretty easy to figure out. And so like when people are asking like, hey, is Blender industry standard? I say yes, because it could do the same things as all these other packages and a whole lot more like that. The way that it's being upgraded and implemented at like a breakneck speed, like I'm, mm. I'm really impressed with all the tools that I see coming out of it. So mm. I would say it's capable of doing all the stuff that the other programs are doing. It's just if you're comfortable working in it or not. That's that's beautifully yeah. said, and I, I agree with you. The only reason I ask that question is because it seems to be the question everyone is arguing about on social media, especially like when you go to yeah. TikTok or, or Instagram. That's where people are like going crazy about this, and they're taking sides. I personally started with Cinema 4D, but I only have like a couple of months in Cinema 4D, not that long. The only reason right. I moved to, um, to Blender is because at the time, I was looking for specific tutorials. And I couldn't find them. And the moment I, I like my friends were using Blender, so I switched, yeah. shout out to Catalyst. <clears throat> I switched immediately and everything I ever wanted, I found tutorials for. And then that yeah. was like, the, that was like the, the decision for me to change because I was like, I need to find out about this shader or this specific texture. And I, I was searching it. It was difficult to find it for Cinema 4D unless I would say like you went down the, the school of motion path, you know, go for a, a linear sort of course that teaches you everything. Yeah. I was sort of just trying to look for YouTube tutorials everywhere. And I think that's the majority of people nowadays look for tutorials like that. Um, very much like how they find your tutorials, the, the, especially the random ones on, on Unreal Engine 5. It's just yeah. I was looking for something like that and I couldn't find it with Cinema 4D. It was so much easier to find it with Blender and I was like, okay, boom, I, I'm going to make this switch. Very difficult for the first few weeks to get, you know, to adjust and adapt, but I don't regret it, especially because anytime I had questions, there's just such a big community answering questions and I felt like that's missing in other communities. Now, I know that other communities have, have so much other things that maybe Blender is missing, but that was just the one thing that attracted me the most. For Blender, and not to mention the one thing that Windwish just mentioned, um, is about how fast Blender is up, updating and upgrading itself with all the new things that are coming about, for sure. <laughs> now, the, the one thing that we just touched on is, is the, the tutorials that you guys are putting out. So one thing I, I, I want us to talk about is the role of YouTubers and YouTuber tutors and creators in general. But first, I want to ask you a question. Have you have you guys watched Everything Everywhere All at Once, the movie? I haven't, no. Okay, all right. You, you got to watch it. It's, 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 I mean, we watch it quite late. We watch it after it won the Oscars. But okay. Everything Everywhere All at Once, for anybody that doesn't know, it's gotten seven Oscars, including Best Editing. Mm -hmm. And with only a small team of six people that are responsible for nearly 500 VFX shots. Now, the movie itself is inspired the, the bagel that you see in the movie, which is, I would say, one of the key elements in the movie, is inspired by Blender Guru's donut tutorials. That's what the editors were saying, apparently, in an article. And what was interesting about that is knowing how much of an impact tutorials in the VFX community can have. That was one example. I can vouch that you and your tutorials about Unreal Engine 5 has impacted so many people in the community to work in certain ways. So I guess what I'm trying to get to is how do you think the role of YouTubers and creators will change when they see that they have such a huge impact? Someone like yourself, for example. Yeah, I mean, it struck me maybe this past year, actually. I did. A, um, I was judging... A contest for Rococo at the beginning of the year and one of the other judges was the VFX supervisor for Industrial Light and Magic so you know he's working on all the Star Wars stuff that's on Disney Plus and he personally sat me aside and said like we're watching your stuff at Industrial Light and Magic to help us get through 
these Star Wars shows and stuff, like, because they're using Unreal wow. Engine over there. And I was thrown back. I was like, no, you're just saying that. He's like, no, dude. He's like, never take a full time job because we need you out there <laughs> for, tutorials <laughs> for when we get stuck. And that that really struck home because it, I didn't realize how much of an impact I actually was having out there in the industry. And then other people started reaching out. A person from NBC Sports reached out and said, like, hey, I took your Unreal course and now I have a full time job at NBC Sports because this is the direction that they want to go. And I'm the only artist that knows how to use it. So they brought them on full time as like your creative director. And it's just it's it's heartening to hear because it's like you are making a difference in people's lives and also shaping where the industry is going in the future as well. And so and when I first started this, it was just for fun. It was almost for me to just still have a voice in the community and communicate with other artists and stuff like that. But it's turning into something a whole lot more. And I wish more creatives were actually like, I know not everybody's comfortable being in front of the camera, but mm -hmm. there's a wealth of knowledge out there that I feel is not being shared because, yeah. you know, people are scared to be in front of the camera or they don't have mm -hmm. the time or, you know, a lot of people are working. So I get it. They don't have a lot of time to do tutorials and stuff, but I mean, including myself, but the way that I got through that was I set up my computer. So if I figure something out, then my camera's right here. I click it on, turn into Wimbush mode, knock it out, <laughs> save it for later, get back to work. And then later that night, I'll edit it together. But I feel like we definitely need more creatives out there because I'm not even the best one out there. I can't lie. Like there's a lot of really good artists. And I'm like, I have I to disagree you with you really there. Sure. I have to disagree with you there. I think you're definitely nah. one of the best. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm being serious. Like, we were talking about this. When you look at Unreal Engine Tutors, like, so many problems have been fixed because of your videos specifically. And and so oh, you. you have saved people loads of time and loads of headaches at 12 a.m. <laughs> when they're trying to figure something out. So it's it's crazy that I just want to say thank you on behalf of us and behalf of the community because your videos no, are phenomenal. You. And where... Are the rest of those the the <laughs> clips, man? The, the five you did five episodes. <laughs> there are those. I, where, where are the rest? Of, we're we are waiting here for, for that. Six, seven, eight. Are, are you still gonna continue the? By the way, for anyone that doesn't know, we're talking about the Unreal Engine Five Beginner series that you did, which were phenomenal. Five episodes. Are we gonna have Thank more? You. Um, possibly. That brings me to a good spot right here. So I actually collaborated with School of Motion. I don't know if you can see wow. this. There but you go. I have a QR code. We announced it on the show floor at NAB, but I have a brand new course coming out next week for CG artists getting into Unreal Engine 5. And so this is all stuff that I've not really taught online before. Like I was figuring a lot of this stuff out. Like they were drilling me like, hey, can Unreal do this? Because, you know, they're primarily Cinema 4D and After Effects. And so they wanted me to come at it from a perspective of a 3D artist using like Blender or Cinema and After Effects. Like, how could they easily jump into Unreal? And so it's a shorter course. It's about six hours. It's at your own pace. And yeah, that's dropping next week. So I could give you guys the QR code. I'm not sure if it's showing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Please, please. If you we, sign we up, can, what we can um, do, what we can do is even get the, the photo from you. Yeah. yeah, we'll get a photo from you. Yeah. We'll put it as an overlay right here so people can go. Is it when is it going to be exactly released? You mentioned. Um, they say sometime next week. So if you scan okay. a QR code, like this is a paid one, but you get 50% off as they want to negotiate that with them through the QR code. <laughs> but, um, I know with me, free education is still something that really true. It holds true to my heart because mm -hmm. when I had my last course a couple of years ago, a lot of people in other countries wanted to take it, but they couldn't afford $200. Like that's, mm -hmm. you know, a couple months worth of income for them. And so that's a big reason why I released that five day course that you guys are talking about, because mm -hmm. I wanted everybody to have a chance to at least learn in some capacity at their own pace mm -hmm. and everything. So I'm still going to do the free education. I actually met with Epic Games at NAB. That was pretty much the biggest reason why I decided to go, because um, we hosted an event to talk about some of the new tools that are coming out and mm -hmm. they're geared towards motion graphics artists. So I would say it's a combination of cinema 40 with the i don't know if i can see all the effects but it's a combination of <laughs> cinema 40 and after effects all wrapped in the one game engine under unreal so it's wow. um it's going to be a big game changer especially for people in a broadcast space like they changed the entire interface for artists and so if you're used to working in like after effects like lyric base and stuff like that mm -hmm. it's exactly going to be like that so wow. it's coming out pretty soon 
And um, I think that's what my next course is going to be on. Like, I'm trying to negotiate with them because, um, you know, when Fortnite Creative first came out, they had that series called, like, Your First Hour and Fortnite mm-hmm. Creative. And so I want to be the one to do Your First Hour in Unreal Engine Avalanche. And so that's what I'm trying to work on right now. And, of course, that will be free online. But, yeah, that's the next the next series that I'm hoping to pump out. We definitely are looking forward to that. We will be number one watching those tutorials all the time. I'm uh, glad he didn't say it's out right now because I would have left this fucking podcast. I'll be on my computer <laughs> watching that shit. It is, first of all, everybody watching, you guys heard it here first because I don't, I haven't heard yeah, of yeah. this. So thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that. Yeah, that um, we're going we're gonna to cut this up, share guys. it with the world. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate that. We didn't know about that either. <laughs> yeah. By the way, we don't script anything on this podcast aside from like our own questions. And, and Jonathan wasn't even aware of the questions we were going to ask. So this is all fresh stuff to us. Um, I just want to say one more thing about the, the, the free education and the tutorials that you're putting out and why they're, they're so important. Because I don't know if you notice it because you're the one putting them out. But as someone who's received it on the receiving end, a lot of people have this urge to try new software, especially Unreal Engine 5 now because like the, the flashiest, the, the fanciest, thing, you know, yeah. and then rightfully yeah. so. And you're always looking for that like breaking point because you're always giving yourself an excuse like, oh, I want to start, but I don't know where, I don't know when. And then boom, when you release something that is so simplified, five episodes, very short, and I'm going to teach you everything. You're going to learn how to go around the software. You're going to learn world building in a very simple manner. And that is just... I remember I woke up, I was like, okay, I knew a bit of Unreal Engine 5, but I knew that I'm going to learn a thing or two just watching your video. So I, I set my alarm clock early in the morning because it was, it was being rise. released. Yeah, I don't know. It was sometime <laughs> early in the morning. I was like, I need to watch this. And I was so excited because I was like, this is going to, I don't have to do anything. I can just sit down, have my coffee, watch and learn. Exactly how I learned Blender from Blender Guru. That was like sort of my, like, the interest point, like I was using Unreal Engine 5, but just for metahumans and, and mocap, I wasn't like right. building worlds. And then your your tutorials was like my breaking point to be like, okay, you know what? Now I can just get a little bit more of an idea of what's going on. And and so again, very, very thankful to the tutorials you put out and very excited for the upcoming series being at, at School of Motion or even the ones that you're putting out yourself. Everyone look forward to that shit. But I think, Farad, yeah, go ahead. Definitely, I got to thank you guys too because you guys did make my course go viral through TikTok. So I really <laughs> appreciate you guys that was, putting that out there because I can't even figure out TikTok myself. So I'm like, I put it out there, I get like five views. You guys put it out there, and that thing just like skyrocketed. So isn't it? Isn't it crazy? It's like you guys. I feel like if you no, no worries at all. I feel like if you were the one promoting yourself probably would have worked but because somebody else was talking about the course that's like people's no, it's, psychology yeah it's the psychology right yeah. when people see for example us as creators really enjoying someone else's content because no matter how much you come and say my course is good I'm gonna teach you this <coughs> it's gonna hit different than like other creators come and say hey I watched this for a one hour yeah. and this is what I created after that like yeah. people would it just feels them. more natural because that's how like people's brains work like if, if someone's promoting their own stuff it feels for some people, like a bit of a sell selling kind of vibe, like I'm marketing my own thing. But if someone else is doing it, it's just psychology. Honestly, we didn't even expect that video to get that many views. It just like exploded. <laughs> people were like, holy shit, I got to learn this. I was like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. Um, right. But, but I, yeah. I think one thing that since we are talking about YouTube content creation and you being one of the pioneers in this space, I want to ask, do you think that with people like you, we have JS Films in the industry too, that creating content... Are you guys right. setting the, I wouldn't call it standard for the DCC software, but imagine if all of you guys move to a new software, tomorrow all the new creators will also will be working in that space. Not just creators, but the, everybody, everybody else in the industry, developers, right? Developers, everyone. So, so like, how important are these creators on YouTube? Because we've been discussing for like past half an hour, like Blender, Unreal Engine, and you guys are moving around. But mm. imagine everyone moves to a new software. <coughs> how would that thing you think will happen? Yeah, no, it like the the creators definitely have a lot more power than we recognize. Like I was told this at or from a couple of people at Epic Games when I was there on Monday. They said that um because we held an event, I was able to invite a lot of the top influencers in the space. Like I had mm-hmm. Grayscale Gorilla there, um, I brought Andrew Kramer, Harry Frank, um, yeah. EJ. Like there was a lot of the OG guys. Um, Clint, yeah, Punisher from the yeah. Corridor crew, Clint. Like a lot of us were able to come speak to Epic Games and they told us that like we recognize that it's because of you guys 
that people try out these softwares and mm -hmm. we want to keep working with you guys to move this stuff forward. So it's like, even at the company level, they recognize like you can make the, the biggest badass product that you could take, but if it's not for people like us and even yourselves, like pushing it and showing people what could be done with it, then it's just going to sit there in the dust. Like you need people yeah. making cool stuff with it. You need people promoting it and really showcasing what could be done with it. And so I've even had people call me like the Andrew Kramer of Unreal because like yeah. Andrew Kramer, you know, like he really amplified After Effects at the time. Like, you know, people were using it a lot in the industry, but he really brought in a strong mm -hmm. interest from people outside the industry for Adobe and After Effects in that regard. So, I mean, just one person can really make a big impact for if a software moves forward or just kind of stays in the dust. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And that's why the creator economy is so important for, for, for let's just specifically talk about this industry. The more people creating content around a specific software or a specific, you know, uh, whatever it may be, there, there's going to be a lot more attention going towards that. So I feel like everybody watching, not just, you know, us, not just yourself, everybody watching, everybody can actually play a huge role into improving the, 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 the software that they love or, or the industry that they love just simply by creating content. So I, I'm sure a lot of people watching right now, they might have done something really cool. Maybe they did like a really cool physics effect or maybe they did yeah. some really cool hair simulation. If you just decide to share that with the world, you will actually, you never know, you might actually end up helping your community by actually a ton. And that's just like accumulating on top of each other, right? That's exactly what we were talking about when we were talking about Blender and now Unreal Engine 5. <clears> the more <throat> people like Jonathan and, and Punisher and JS Films and all these people create for Unreal Engine 5, it's just going to attract so many Houdini, Cinema 40, Blender artists who all come and learn the software. And that makes the experience of the software a lot better because there's more tutorials out there. There's more cool effects to learn from. And I just think that's genuinely what I recommend. If anybody's comfortable at sharing their work, I think they should be because it just helps the community grow so, yeah. so much. Now, And these software companies are listening too. Like I, mm -hmm. I have a really close relationship with Epic Games, of course, and then also Maxon as well. And yep. I've been there when they're watching stuff like on Instagram and YouTube and they're seeing the stuff that could be done and it is making an impact on they're like hey this person is doing it mm -hmm. this way maybe we can make their lives easier if we implement these tools in there so they don't have to go through like 50 steps just to do a hair simulation or something like yeah. that so these companies are actively watching what everybody's doing and i would just say the more you can put your stuff out there the better it is because if they see like a lot of people are having problems with hair simulations, then they need to, or they know they need to go back to the drawing board and say like, Hey, how can we make this easier for the artists to be able to implement this? So more people are able to do this. So it's definitely one of those things where it's a give and take on both sides. Do, do you think like these companies like Epic games and Adobe have to have a structured strategy for getting feedback from creators like you or or how, how does it work like do you go back to them and say that hey i think there is a problem with in this area or there is a lot of demand in the other area is it you going to them or they are coming to you it's um yeah how do i answer this without bad <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll speak to the epic game side of things because okay. they're they probably are the most artist friendly company that I've ever had like the pleasure of speaking with. Right. Like they've actually reached out to me on several occasions and said, Hey, we're looking at, you know, like adding motion graphics in here. What would you want us to do and make this easier for artists? And also, can you put us in contact with other artists that might be interested so we could get feedback? And they actually did, you know, we had a big wow. email chain going we're exchanging ideas back and forth and a lot of that stuff they showed on monday to us they implemented a lot of the you know requests that we put in there so it's like they're listening wow um some companies listen better than others i would say <laughs> um, maxon is pretty good about hearing us out the people over there at cinema 4d red giant um they're pretty good um do you think yeah, this I'll had direct impact? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think this had impact? Because, okay, we see that a lot of Unreal Engine content is coming out of you. Do you think that comfortable relationship that you have with Epic Games and that feedback loop impacted the content that you're creating? Absolutely. Because if they ask me for something and then they implement it, then I turn right back around and share with people like, hey, these are the updates that have come out and 
you know, it's it's a good, healthy relationship back and forth. Mm-hmm. And then even with like the Epic Mega Grant, like they're like, hey, we want you to keep focusing on making education tutorials, whether it's for Unreal or stuff related to Unreal. So we're going to help fund you so that you don't have to take on so many client projects and you could just be a pillar for the community out there. So I definitely do have a lot of love for Epic because I feel like mm-hmm. they are I mean, they're a big corporation, right? But it seemed mm-hmm. like they are artists first, even, you know, just even on like their marketplace. Like, I think they only take 12% of the sale and they mm-hmm. leave the rest to the artist. And so there's a lot of that, that going says on a lot. it seems that like says they're... A lot, yeah. yeah. It does. Uh, you, you brought up the Epic Mega Grant and I'm sure at least some of the people watching either being developers or creators and artists who are working in, in Unreal Engine 5 and would like to be able to get funded... First of all, how did you go about getting the Epic Mega Grant? Was it an easy task? Was it difficult? What's the process like? And is there any recommendations that you have to people who are looking to get funding for themselves, for their projects? Yeah. So a lot of people don't notice. They actually split the Mega Grant into two different categories. And so they do have, um, they have the development side. So whether you're doing like immersive experiences or video games or, you know, things of that, what you will typically think of Unreal Engine for. They have a mega grant set aside for that, but then they also have one on the educational side, which people don't um, don't really realize. And so I applied for the educational mega grant and I put together a whole list of stuff that I would do for 12 months. So, you know, like live streams, um, the, the free course was a big part of it in there. Mm-hmm. And then I also committed to at least doing one tutorial um, um, a week for Epic mm-hmm. through my channel and I'm not going to lie. It took a while for it to get processed because I think they get thousands of applications. Of course they do. Something like that. So it actually, I got accepted for the mega grant a year to the day from when I applied for it. So Mm -hmm. it's like maybe a couple of months in, maybe like three months in, I did get an email saying like, Hey, we're still reviewing your application. But Mm -hmm. on my side, I didn't wait to get the mega grant. I was like, okay, I was going to do this stuff anyway. So I'm going to keep pumping out the free education keep attending these conferences and you know just doing what i do and i think they actually saw that and they recognized and it was like okay this guy's true to his word and so mm-hmm. i think that's why i was able to get the mega grant but yeah everything that i applied for was all education and community based and yeah it's been um it's been cool because then i got to be even more in depth with the epic team once i really mm-hmm. start to get talking to them and stuff like that and I feel like that relationship only grew because of the mega grant and me applying for it and them getting to really know me and everything. Yeah, that's wonderful. We're very glad that you got it. And I think you, out of all the people, deserve it, especially when you're talking about educating people in the in the world yeah, of Unreal yeah. Engine 5. So we're very glad you got it. I hope that was also helpful to people watching so that they know now, okay, you know what? If I'm doing something related to Unreal Engine 5, either creating an immersive experience, be it VR or a game, or educating, I now have a chance of going for it. Yeah. And, and I guess you, you recommend people giving it a try, right? Absolutely. Even the people um, at the Mega Grant, they always say they want people to apply for it. But mm. I know, and I guess I could give up this secret here. They say if you're going to apply for the Mega Grant, don't make it like a Santa Claus wish list of stuff that you want. Don't <laughs> say like, "Hey, I need two hundred thousand dollars because I'm going to buy cameras and LED screens and these crazy computers and stuff." Mm. Like that's not what they want it for. Like they want to mm. see how the mega grant is going to make your life easier for you to Mm -hmm. get to the end product and so i know even inside the application they're like do you have a prototype for which you want to show us so Mm -hmm. a lot of people that didn't even start with anything like they just applied like they had an idea and they applied they got denied immediately but the people that actually had like a working function of their game or Mm -hmm. you know like with me in the course like i put together like a sample course of how i would go about it like they love seeing that you are at least proactive and yeah. trying to, you know, get your thing started and you just need help getting over the finish line for that. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely say if you're if you want to get a mega grant, definitely put your money where your mouth is. Show that you are passionate about what you're trying to pursue. And I think they'll just help you get to the finish line at the end there. That's the secret. There you go. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. We really appreciate that. And I, I know Absolutely. that's going to help a lot of people. Um, Farah, should we go and apply right now? <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> I'm applying <laughs> I'm 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 for that. Make here. sure you flip out the phone right there. <laughs> but it's, it, no, it's, 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 it's great information. Now, let's 
move on and talk about the Unreal Engine Fortnite editor, or or we can even call it the future of Unreal Engine, the future of Metaverse, whatever you want to call it. So um, yeah. I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of a backstory. We posted our reaction about the Fortnite editor, and we were amazed by it. Of course, it's, it's huge, knowing how... Because we're gamers as well, so knowing how big Fortnite has been for the community, how much people love playing that game, right? And and now Unreal Engine or Epic Games bringing and up essentially upping the game of the the creative in Fortnite and essentially allowing now developers and artists like ourselves and the people watching to be able to now use Unreal Engine or at least a stripped down version of Unreal Engine to create anything in the world of Fortnite. Now. When we posted our reaction, there was as a hate usual. comment. There was a bunch of hate comments, and I'm going to read yeah. one to you. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it's normal. And usually it happens on TikTok. I don't know why. We get a lot of hate on TikTok. Because when people don't connect that well on TikTok. They're just scrolling through, so they don't mind just saying yep. shit if they want to. Whereas YouTube, they're like connected with you. They're watching you for a long time. I've, I, at least I feel like that's why. I don't know. Yeah. I They're just less so merciful too. on TikTok <laughs> and Instagram. You know what I mean? I was like, we are, we are Absolutely. saying that, oh my God, you have now more opportunity to make money, to create, and people are like, oh, this is shit. I'm They're like, hating. Oh. Yeah. So this this specific person, I'm not going to name them, uh, <laughs> but they, they shat on us by saying... <laughs> Gary's mod did this first and it's been there for ages. There was other comments like this and I mean, no disrespect to Gary's mod. We didn't even say anything <laughs> about Gary's mod. We didn't disrespect anybody. And I understand, you know, there, there has been uh, games like Roblox. This is exactly what, Jonathan, you yeah. mentioned in our chat that Roblox has been doing similar stuff. And we never compared and say, oh, like this is the first time anybody's doing this. It's more of what we saw is the capabilities that Unreal Engine has and the user base that Unreal Engine has. And now the developers and, and, and creators are motivated because of the whole creator economy to yeah. create for Fortnite and the player base that Fortnite has all together. But you know, these are just our thoughts, our reactions. I want to get your thoughts on this comment specifically of like, oh, these guys did it first. There's like a copy. And also, what do you think is the difference between the Roblox and the Gary's mod versus the Unreal Engine Fortnite editor. Yeah, I mean, I always go back to Mike Tyson, right? He always says it's not about who hits first, it's who hits the hardest, you know? So somebody <laughs> could have done it a long time ago, but, you know, I feel like Fortnite, they have something, and don't quote me, I want to say 70 million active users. It's either a week or a month, they were mm -hmm. saying. So, <clears throat> sorry, that's a whole plethora of people that you can have access to for your content and so it's not only about building experiences you can make assets for the fab store so like if you're a sculptor you could be making like assets that people could buy for their fortnite experiences or if you make textures or particle effects like they're going to have a store that's implemented in there for people to make money and the same thing like they're only going to take 12 percent you take the rest and it's another avenue for creatives to actually make some side income, which kind of brings us back full circle, right? To when you guys were asking about like, if you're going to start as an artist brand new today, how would you jump into it? And I can honestly say like, I would jump into these ecosystems like Roblox, like Fortnite creative. And even if I don't want to like program or make my own experience, there's still opportunity there for you to create and then sell your creations for other people to use in their experiences. So mm -hmm. I don't see it as a negative. I only see it as a positive. And even if, you know, like Roblox is out there, Gary Mods is out there, Minecraft is out there, like there's always room for competition. So it's mm -hmm. never healthy just to have like one king of the hill. You always want to have competition because they innovate each other to keep pushing forward. A hundred percent. And do you think that people can eventually make a living out of just creating for Unreal Engine Fortnite editor and, and also yes. selling assets on the marketplace? Like n no jobs, just creating every single day. Do you think that can become a job, a full-time job on its own? Yeah. I mean, we've seen it happen like with Roblox. There's kids that are out there, 15, 16, 17 year olds. They're making more money than I am, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> making <laughs> stuff on Roblox. You know? so, that's why I was extremely excited. Like, you know, I've played Roblox with my kids and stuff like that, downloaded Roblox Studio, played around with it. But I felt like Fortnite Creative, that's more of my warehouse because like you guys said, they basically gave you like a stripped down version of 
Unreal Engine 5, and I know that like the back of my hand now, right? So mm-hmm. I'm more excited to actually do Fortnite experiences than I ever was before. Like, I never even played Fortnite in the past, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And ever I'm, since I'm, that we're, we're more of a Call out, of Duty person. I think you yeah. too as well, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. more of my speed. Call of Duty, Doom, things of that, like Halo. But um, yeah. oh, Halo. after that came out, I was like, okay, let me see what this Fortnite thing is all about. I jumped in there and I probably play Fortnite every night now, just trying to really understand that ecosystem and Mm -hmm. seeing how I could, you know, immerse myself into there and start making money off there as well. So I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity for people to make a lot of money there in the long run, because I know Epic Games, they're betting on it, right? Like that's their metaverse. Like that's when they Mm -hmm. say like Epic is getting into the metaverse, like that they've already built the metaverse, like Fortnite's been out Mm -hmm. forever. So this is their way of bringing us into the metaverse to keep creating and expanding on it. I mean, a, a very stupid but simplified version of this whole concept is like comparing TV and social media. On TV, you need to have producers and and, and storytellers to come and create shows for people to be entertained and watch. Whereas now social media allows everybody to create. And this is exactly what's happening. You had games where the game developers had to create the games and now everybody can create games, right? And again, and you it's get so been, much diversity when that happens, right? Every yeah. person is a creator. You get different different cultures in there, different aspects, different point of views. And mm-hmm. it's and I think it will grow much faster yeah. because it's not one point of view anymore. It's mm-hmm. like now everybody is able to create. A hundred percent. And 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 even sorry, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna say even like I keep going back to Roblox, but you look at a lot of people there that would have never had the time of day to create a video game because of AAA publishers or whatever. And it's mm-hmm. just, it's hard to get into, right? But they built mm-hmm. their experience in Roblox. And now a lot of those people have built their own IP to where they got like merchandise deals, they got publishing deals, they got books, they got all types of crazy stuff. Like there's a game on there, I think it's called like Bad Piggy or something. Mm -hmm. And I was at Walmart and I actually saw like those characters from that game as action figures. They're on book bags, they're on notebooks. And so it's like now people will build their dreams and their experiences and then they could take it outside of that as well. So like you said, like a lot of times the doors have been locked to us in the past and television and movies, but with like YouTube, people are making their own, like they're like, okay, I can't talk to Warner Brothers to get this produced. I'm going to put it out on myself on YouTube. They make like a billion views and then the studios start coming to them. So it's just a way for you to amplify yourself and really take a bet on yourself, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. And I want to talk about your own experience using uh, using this software, specifically creating for Fortnite. Um, I think you've already played around with it a little bit. What are your thoughts yeah. on using Verse? I, I mean, we're no, we're not developers. We we don't really know that much coding. Fire knows a little bit. I don't know that much coding. So knowing, right. I believe at the time that we are speaking now, there's not blueprints that we can use instead you have to actually code it in using verse what do you think about that and are we getting that even right because we don't have much experience with it i want to hear it from you no you're right so the coding platform for fortnite creative is called versus it's um Mm. something like yourself like i'm not really a coder myself like i could do Mm. a little bit of blueprinting and unreal but coding isn't really my my background there and so there's stuff that you can do that's automated and unreal Mm. if you are inside of fortnite creative but it's like if you really want to hunker down into the nitty gritty and you know make stuff that's not automated like you want to code it yourself you do have that option there i do know that they said that as they're expanding on fortnite creative because this is still beta version 2.0 they're mm-hmm. going to start making it easier for to have um almost like templates you know so it's like if you want to instead of writing the verse code for open this door or flick mm-hmm. this light or whatever like they'll have that as like an automated or automated template. And so mm-hmm. I think as we push forward and everything and people are actually making their feedback known in the forums and stuff like that, that the verses is going to be more for the hardcore programmers, but anybody's still going to be able to go in there and make their own experience of their liking. Yeah, a hundred percent. Now, Jonathan, we're reaching the one hour mark. I just want to know your time. Are we cool to have another 10 minutes? If, if you're cool with that, I just want to make sure. Cause so yeah, just like, few more questions to go for yeah no i'm fine nobody's hit me up yet so oh good yes. to go. okay let's do this <laughs> so let's fucking yeah. go because farhad actually had a, a specific question he wanted to ask about uh the, like epic games in general yeah i think because we talked about how 
you are in contact with them and all this feedback loop is going on. But imagine now tomorrow you're in charge of Epic Games. What changes would you make to make the software better? And who better than Oof. you to be in charge of Epic Games? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's almost like, like I'm no programmer, right? So I can only be yeah. an idea guy over there. Mm-hmm. But I feel like, I know for me personally, and this is stuff that's actually being worked on, but just making stuff more artist friendly because you know at the end of the day unreal engine is a game engine it's still Mm -hmm. you still have to go in there with like a a game developer mentality i know that's been a big hurdle for a lot of people just even navigating this stuff in there Mm -hmm. it does have a certain way of thinking and so i would just go in there and make it more friendly for people that do want to make the jump into unreal for whatever reason it's a little bit more recognizable so if they're coming from blender or they're coming from cinema 4d they're not having to jump these hoops of I'm used to navigating in this system and now it's totally different. Like I would just try to make it as friendly as possible for other mediums to jump in because at the end of the day, especially with Unreal Engine 5, they made it known that they're not just a game engine anymore. Like they want to break into Hollywood. They want to break into the automotive. They want to break into Archviz and things like that. So it's more of a multimedia platform now than ever. But to be able to bring in all these mediums, you have to cater to the people that you're trying to bring in. And so I know it's easier said than done, but that would probably be my focus if I was over there. Mm. So Epic knows now if Tim wants to get retired, (laughs) Winbush is the best choice to to take over. (laughs) Winbush is CEO. Let's go. We're going to be making it more artist friendly. Um, We, we, we definitely agree with you on that. I think, I mean, the, the software is just great. There's no like, big problems or anything this was just a fun question we were thinking of asking you to see what you would change and knowing that being making it artist friendly that is definitely something that every software can do as well i think like if you can make your software more um user friendly for example when i was so i used to be on premiere pro and now i'm doing davinci resolve when you open davinci resolve (laughs) yeah there you go okay a lot of people have made that fucking switch okay now now if i put this on tiktok i guarantee a lot of there's gonna be a lot of hate but it's okay but it's okay it's just i mean there's 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 pros and cons for both software but making the switch i remember correctly if i remember correctly davinci resolve tells you if you're coming from Premiere Pro, we can like change your shortcuts. And I found that to be yeah. fascinating, right? Like the yep. moment you see that, it's like saying we're not insecure about our software. We know we're great. If you're coming from Premiere Pro, we don't, we're not afraid of mentioning their name. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Like we give you the Premiere Pro shortcuts just so you can use the software better. I know, for example, some softwares, they won't even mention the other guy's name because they, they, yeah. they want to keep it competitive. And you never truly win if you're like that and that goes across the board for anything even as creators as youtubers i feel like if you're just always doing your own thing and you're closed off that's that's when you're you're there's always going to be a cap to you but when you're open to collaborate when you're open to talk about everything so with softwares i genuinely agree with you i think that will be uh, the, fan, the 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 best way to go about it quick question I- davinci resolve reason to move was it color grading like many people or what was the the specific reason that you moved out no, I was banging my head just trying to edit my YouTube tutorials because <laughs> I have the creative suite, right? So that was, I mean, honestly, like I'm not an editor, so I had access to Premiere. And so that's why I started editing with it. But for my tutorials, I like to film them at 4K and at 60 mm. frames per second, just because I feel like I, I want to film at the highest resolution possible. Mm. I feel like the frame rate at 60 FPS just make it a lot more smooth and a lot more manageable for people on the other side to see it maybe i don't know some people like 24 but i think 60 especially as a gamer i just always found it to be smoother 100%. for the frame rate but um trying to do 4k 60 fps in premiere was just like trying to i don't know it's like watching paint dry like i would import <laughs> it. it was have problems importing and then i'm trying to edit and i couldn't edit it so Crashes, i had to make man. proxies and all this stuff and then you would get that sheep sound because everything just crashes. And I'm just like, there there has to be a better way. And funny enough, um, I'm filming. My, my camera is actually a Blackmagic 4K camera that I bought. And it came with the um, professional version of DaVinci Resolve. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, I have it. I'm also giving it a shot. And I brought in a 4K 60 FPS clip that I did. And it ran it beautifully. Like, yeah. no problems, no hiccups. I didn't have to make proxies or anything. So... At that point forward, I'm like, okay, th- this is it. This is what I'm going to be using, and yeah, I've been. Th- I think I've been using it for about two to three years now, so mm-hmm. it's been it's been holding up pretty well. 
It's it's I I totally agree with you. I mean, we 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 made the switch. We're happy, you know, with, especially with the color grading part. It's, it's everything ab- ab- about the software just runs smoothly. I love the tabs at the bottom. Yeah. It makes it so simple. Like you're just gonna jump to the next section now. You know, it's like very linear yeah. in terms of like what you gotta do to export your video. But right. at the same time, now like Premiere Pro is coming out with all these cool AI updates, and I'm like. Yeah, fuck I did it's i like, did i make the right <laughs> choice like auto subtitles was there for a while now but but now they're adding in like really cool things for podcasters like it auto cuts your clips or something like that someone's added that as a plugin there's so many cool things right. coming around i'm like i don't uh, know should it's, we should it's, we like it's always a difficult decision to to switch software choose one and it's always pros and cons it's always never a single choice mm-hmm. it's always trade-off yeah what are you giving off and what are you getting at the end of the day so it really depends on every personal choice. I would Definitely. Say. And, and uh, I sorry. I think Resolve is actually getting into some of the AI stuff as well. I saw there's mm-hmm. some AI enhancements inside of Resolve that came out in mm-hmm. the past couple of weeks. So mm-hmm. I think they're they're definitely going to start dipping their toes in it because um, they're very competitive as well. So I can't see them letting Adobe just have all the AI fun, right? So yeah, I think yeah. it's going to get interesting this year just with <laughs> all the platforms and AI, you know? It's going to be fun watching it. And, and, and speaking of AI... Um, Farad, you wanna no, go ahead. Yeah, I think the moment we talked about AI, I had to ask all these questions because now, I mean, everybody's talking about AI, new AI tools coming up. We are testing things out, but I want to know in your workflow, do you use any AI tools and how they how they are helping you to improve your process, increase the quality? Yeah, I would have to say, um, like I've experimented with AI in the past. Um, I know last year when Mid Journey first came out, I played around with version one. Um, I mean, it was cool. It, you could tell a mid journey thing at the time, right? Like it always had that smeary effect. So yep. I really wasn't into it as much. I didn't have a problem as much as some other artists with the ethical side of things, because I'm just like, this is, it, it always happens, right? Like mm-hmm. people are so up in arms because it's scraping the internet. And I mean, rightfully so, like you don't want your data and your style stolen. But at the same time, I'm like, a lot of artists are using kit bash stuff and mm-hmm. you didn't model that stuff or they're using mega scans. Like you didn't physically go out there and shoot that stuff. And so people are buying assets to use in their projects anyway. So it's not like artists are being a hundred um, percent authentic with themselves because everybody's using a little leverage where they can. And so for me, I'm looking at AI as a tool as I can implement it in my workflow. Um, I don't do the whole mid journey, like typing a prompt, oh, I made this dope image and post it up online because <laughs> it, I, I don't know, like that stuff I'm kind of weird about. But yeah, I definitely love the stuff like um, Blockade. I just discovered oh, a yeah. couple of weeks ago and making like 360 HDRs. And then you could bring that into Unreal and kind of build on top of that or even just use it for lighting. Like HDRs were something that um, I use a lot inside of my workflow. So mm-hmm. having that type of capability, I think is cool. And then, you know, we talked about like Move AI, like, I love the the AI motion capture, whether it's Move AI or Rococo moves and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. not having to put on a mocap suit, definitely a plus in my in my eyes. <laughs> I, I try to especially as as, as to, more buff you yeah, get. That's where the gym workouts yeah, are con. Yeah. Farhad was asking me. He was like, "Wait a second, because uh, we were talking about mocap." He was like, "What is like can like I feel like Windbush is going to." grow out of his suits because if he's going to be lifting like how are you going to get actually, a that's size what happens yeah no yeah, I, actually 100 that's what happened like that's why i don't wear my rococo suit anymore and i've actually talked to those guys because i'm like guys you only make an xl i'm like i can't wear an xl anymore <laughs> <laughs> we, bought, we bought large we, we have rococo yeah. large and it's not that big so i think xl definitely won't fit yeah, you no. with the workout now yeah, like I, if I put it on, it, I literally look like a Power Ranger, like, <laughs> so, like stuck to my body. And I'm just like, I can't do this. And then I had the XAN suit, which was cool. Um, mm. But that one, it's a long process, right? Because it's not, it wasn't a suit. You just mm. like put the sensors on Velcro. Yeah. And so it had like 16 sensors that you're putting all over yourself. So that was a whole process, putting yeah. each sensor on, making sure they're lined up. And mm. yeah, it, that was a process. And so when the AI stuff started becoming more prevalent, I'm like, okay, mm. that that's me right there. No yeah, suit. Yeah, that's, that's where we're going. Cameras, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's the best thing that has happened, I would say, in the mocap industry because like it's going to democratize motion capture. And that's exactly what is happening with Fortnite as well. Move AI just announced, I believe, a yeah, partnership. Yep. Right, there you go. You yep. want to talk about that if you have some info? 
Yeah, I mean, I've only heard what you guys seen online, but the big thing that I was thinking about is, you know, so everybody uses Mixamo, right? Like it's been mm -hmm. a prevalent motion capture premiere system for like the past like 15 years, right? Like yeah. you put your character in there, you auto rig it, and it just has a whole plethora of motion capture data. And so when they announced Move AI for Fortnite Creative, I'm like, okay, now there's an opportunity for people to make their own motion capture and sell it on the fab store wow. so yeah. as we're going back to how we could monetize ourselves as artists there's another avenue and anybody could do it right like i know actually i can't say it like okay so there's some <laughs> stuff coming from <laughs> there's some stuff coming from move ai that's going to make it really really possible for anybody to dive in and be able to do motion capture like i know the number one complaint i got on my video is yeah you're using four iphones and an ipad I can't afford that. And I'm like, well, you know, the limit is two, but you still need at least three iOS devices, right? To even mm -hmm. get started. But they're going to be implementing some stuff that's going to make it even more easier for people to really dive in. And once you get dive in, then you can start making assets for Fortnite Creative and you can start selling them. So I see the future for artists only being brighter because mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about as much looking for the big clients. Like a lot of people ask me like, hey, how did you work with Discovery or Hasbro and mm -hmm. stuff and I'm looking at it like hey how can I stop doing that much stuff and actually <laughs> get more into making my own content and selling it to the public so yeah it's gonna it's gonna be interesting you might see a Wimbush store on the epic store <laughs> oh. just telling all types of crazy stuff so. looking forward to that definitely the motion capture we're going to be seeing from Winbush is going to be some lifting. Oh, yeah. 100%. Oh, no, no. <laughs> You're just going Winbush to be recording yeah, yeah. yourself. in Fortnite. <laughs> there you go. Bice oh, we just gave an idea, actually. Bicep curls. I want to see that. Press. I want to see that. We, that's all the stuff we don't have, right? So, yeah, yeah definitely going to do the Winbush fitness set in the AI and bring that to Fortnite Creative near you. And definitely, I'll give you guys credit for bringing it up. So <laughs> I, would, I would love to see that happen. Now, there's one thing as well that I want to touch on. We're, we're almost finished with this uh, topic of AI, but I just want to finish with one thing. You did mention that the future is brighter for artists. You did also yeah. quote uh, something previously, and I'm just going to say, if you want to be an artist now, it's the best time since there's so much out there. I believe this was in a previous podcast that you've done. Now, do you think at any point all of these can become potentially overwhelming for upcoming artists and, and, and also become a problem of up not knowing where to start. So I'll give, an, yeah. uh, I'll give an example. For example, right now with the developments that are happening in AI, of course, if right now we have the generative images, so you have the text to image, eventually that's going to become text to 3D models. Eventually that's going to yeah. become text to textures and probably text to rigs, probably text to animation, and all these big, big parts of, you know, let's say, let's just talk about creating a movie. You'll have like a whole department focusing on modeling, department on texturing and all this. So if it's becoming a brighter future, at the same time, I feel like it's becoming overwhelming because as a new artist, do I want to double down and just learn modeling now? Or am I going to feel like that's going to be drowning under the umbrella of AI? Or do I want to become a professional texture or shader artist? Or maybe that's not the right way. Or do I want to become an animator? Or wait a second, maybe I should just do all and learn Unreal Engine 5 and be able to create worlds. So that sort of throws us back to the first question. Where do you think artists should start now with the entire development that is happening in AI? Yeah. So I would say start where your passion is. So like you're saying, like if you're somebody that's in the world building, then definitely focus on world building until you learn the tools and then you can kind of go outside of that. Or if you're into character animation, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that you could get into. I wouldn't be deterred by AI right now or even in the future, because I know people are saying like, oh, AI is going to take our jobs. But I don't honestly believe that because the one thing that AI is, is doing is machine learning and they have to learn off of what we're doing. So if everybody stopped creating, then they have nothing to learn from and then the AI becomes irrelevant, right? So mm -hmm. if we're not putting anything out there, then the AI has nothing to pull from. And so I still think there's a good place for artists to keep creating. Yeah, AI is going to help and assist in some of that. And even in some cases, you know, there's going to be people that are just going to abuse it and just go strictly AI for whatever. Like we actually seen that fashion magazine that 
did the AI cover spread, I mean, you could tell it was AI because the hands were all janky. And yeah. <laughs> some of the stuff was kind of awkward. But, I mean, there's going to be those cases, right? But, I mean, you even still have those cases today where people are straight up taking stuff off of like Turbo Squid and then mm. not even making it their own. They just render it, upload it, and call it a day. Like we saw that a lot in the NFT space, like a lot mm. of plagiarism yeah. and <laughs> stuff like that. But so there's always going to be bad people and, you know, using it for the wrong reasons. But on the flip side, I think that um, there's always going to be, it's going to make our lives a lot easier. Like, I know for us, you know, the rigging, the auto rigging has been out there forever. Like we said, the automated motion capture, if we could figure out a way to do AI with like UVing, because I hate doing oh UVs my and goodness. Like the textures oh my and stuff God. like that. Yes. So, That's yeah, like the first like thing that, that we need, man. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm here for all of that stuff. Like auto, like I know the rotoscoping is going to take a lot of jobs away from like South Korea and India, but mm -hmm. you know, like rotoscoping AI, that's going to be a big deal or maybe it helps them, you know, cause maybe like you said, that maybe where they have 500 shots, maybe someone's like, I don't have the time to AI rotoscope all these different shots. And so they can send it to a facility somewhere and maybe they do specialize in rotoscoping and they use AI to just, you know, fulfill that process and make it a lot faster or smoother. So now they can take I in more projects, say, right? Now, instead of yeah, taking like one or two, well, now yeah. they take it 10. It helps them actually, because now they save time on the things that the things that they did, but mm -hmm. they didn't like doing it. Now they can save that right. time, focus on their passion, create yeah. more, make more money. And I think it's a good thing for the whole community and creators as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with people and how they take it. But I think in the long run, I think the AI is actually good for the industry, especially as somebody that's been in it for so long. And I know how painstakingly a lot of this stuff is, you know, when you have to do it manually. And it, it's almost like when we went from film to digital, right? Like whenever they were making like the first Star Wars, they were actually like taking a film and like slicing it and like editing and taping it together and everything. Mm -hmm. Now we have stuff like Resolve where we can edit everything digital. So it's almost like that step all over again. It's like we're taking something, it, you know, that was probably somebody's job too, right? Like there was somebody that had to physically cut these film and it's yeah. like they see like premiere and stuff coming out and they're probably like holy crap this is going to take my job but there's no reason why they can't learn how to do it in digital you know and just mm -hmm. take the the knowledge that they know about editing manually and just translating that to the digital world so there's always going to be those people that are going to be complaining but i'm always like as long as you just embrace it and keep up with it then you should be fine I honestly wouldn't put it any other way. I think we, we'd love to hear your take on this because it's so relevant and, and related to how we think about this whole situation. We talked about this almost with every guest on the podcast. And I just love yeah. to see that the, the concept of knowing that this is happening what am I going to do about it, right? I'm just going to I'm right. gonna focus on improving myself. I'm going to use it to help me and I'm going to use it to improve myself, to get better and quicker and faster and create more. And anybody who decides to do that, I think is going to win. That's, that's, that's where I think we agree. But that was what I yeah. wanted to ask you for AI Fire. Do you have anything else? I, would I, th I think we have covered all the AI questions. I think yeah. it was very interesting to see the point of view of how things will change because Vinbush has been in the industry for... A long time he has seen all these changes and this is not something new yeah. like the star wars example that he mentioned and it's going to happen and i think people who adapt are going to win at the end of the day a hundred percent please yeah, i was going to say I, i've been that guy that um like when i when i first started there was these systems they cost like half a million quarter million called like flint flame and smoke they were made by a company well they used to be discrete now they're autodesk but these systems were basically what they used before like Cinema 40 and After Effects. And they cost a lot of money. Like I said, they were like half a million dollars. Um, you had to have a special technician assigned to it just to keep up with these machines. And the artists that were trained on them, they made a crap ton of money because it was hard to find people specialized for these machines. Mm -hmm. And then here I come, this kid knowing After Effects and 3D Max's cinema, and I could do the same things that they're doing at a fraction of the cost. And I saw that turmoil that was there and they would always do the same things to try to compare, right? Like, oh, this isn't the future. Like, this is a high-end system and blah, blah, blah. And then they see the renders that I'm producing and the studios are like, why are we paying a quarter million for these machines when the software is only a couple thousand dollars and 
you know, there, there was that toss up there. So it's either those people had to like get with the times and learn the softwares of the time, or they could keep complaining and lose their jobs, you know? So we're starting to see that happening again, even with the real time stuff, right? Like I remember when I first brought real time up, it was 2019. A lot of people were curious about it, but then you had a lot of the offline rendering people actually like death threatened me in the DMs. Like, this oh, real time stuff is a lie and this is never going to be industry standard and nobody's using this stuff and i'm just like just wait and see okay just wait. just just wait <laughs> yeah, wait until 2023 yeah. like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm like I, I i'm pretty good at seeing what's coming ahead and i'm mm -hmm. just like the people that want to be dinosaurs and you know stay stuck in their ways like i realize people have a lifetime of learning this stuff but mm -hmm. you have to adapt right that's the only way you're going to stay ahead as artists so it's fine to um to know what you know, but take that knowledge into the next mediums that are coming up. Because if you don't, the next generation is right there at the doorstep, knocking on the door, waiting to get the opportunity to jump in. So you got to either keep up or you know get your butt kicked out the door as the next generation is coming in. This, oh, this is yeah. very accurate, and I think mm -hmm. you get a lot of cues from your children, like what you mentioned about Roblox and all the, those things are happening. So you can see actually what is coming with the next generation, mm -hmm. and you can prepare yeah. yourself. So that is that is also a very good measure to see how things are moving. Oh yeah, I think I think Absolutely. the way you you put it was right on point. Uh, it's it's just life's a cycle and it happens all yeah. over again right all of these things we've seen before even if you haven't seen it you've read it in history books you saw it on the internet the when internet happened yeah. people were complaining about you know how internet's never gonna catch and look at like our entire lives are on the internet the same thing's happening yeah. with you know ai with all these new technologies so if you just like we just talk about i think winbush has said it beautifully like if you just embrace it then you're gonna be able to ride that wave and if you don't then gonna get kicked out the door i think that was beautifully yeah. said um i i i honestly I, I could do this for another five hours with farad than you because you have so many things you can talk about but we appreciate your time we appreciate the fact that you you made it here today and shared all the cool stuff that you did i'm i'm sure so many people watching today have gotten a lot of value but so much alpha the the course the the news that we got from epic yep. like so many new things that i think it was it was great to have this session today. A hundred percent. Is there anything uh, you'd like to share with, with anyone watching right now, be it something that you're doing in the future that you want them to look out for or a, a recommendation, a, a piece of advice? Yeah, no, um, just, you know, as always, if people can support me on YouTube, it goes a long way. Like a lot of people watch the videos, but if you could just subscribe that, that helps in the long term, right? Like I know a lot of people don't think the subscription numbers um have any meeting but they actually do especially when pulling in sponsorships and things of that nature so all i ask is if you watch at least just subscribe it's free you know it helps mm -hmm. goes a long way and then um got a lot of tv projects still coming out actually on netflix today the latest power ranger special it's an hour-long special i did the yes. motion graphics for that that drops today on netflix and then um got a couple more shows coming out just follow me on all the social medias to see what's happening at Jonathan Wimbush on Instagram and Twitter and of course YouTube there and you know a lot of people ask me questions uh, I, I'm not tech support so I don't know everything but, you know, <laughs> I, I, I try to I try to help whenever I can so if people want to leave me comments on YouTube I, I try my best to answer what I know there but please understand I, I don't know everything like any artist these these programs are massive, right? Like I tell people all the time, like I've used cinema since 2006 and I feel like I only know like 5% of that program. Like it's hard to know everything about these programs. I know enough to get the job done for what I need to pursue, but yeah, definitely, definitely give me some slack there. I'm trying. Yeah. So. so the take on that, guys, is if you have any questions with Cinema 4D, you know who to ask. You go to Jonathan. <laughs> Bush, he's gonna he's gonna be your man. Unreal Engine Five. Any and issues? He's go got you. Way. You know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> jokes aside, I I mean, honestly, you've you've solved so many people's problems. I'm sure people know exactly what you do and 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 how you do your things and and we're a big fan of you and we hope you keep creating what you create because no, we're going to be there to support and i'm sure everybody watching is going to be there to support like jonathan said everybody make sure you go to his youtube channel hit that subscribe button if you want to hear the you know the what i what i wish bush. here every day <laughs> go there that's the only place you're going to hear it um and also follow him on instagram 
and Twitter for all the cool gym stuff. If you guys are into working out, he's putting a lot of that recently and, and, and a lot of his personal life is, is available there. So if you want to stalk him a little bit, those are the platforms we recommend. And yeah, definitely. That, um, I would yeah. say tag, tag BPI Sports on Instagram as well. I'm trying to be the first motion graphics artist to have my own line of workout supplements. Like I want to have Wimbush Whey Protein and wimbush creatine and you know I've oh, had that's a, amazing I have a good relationship with those guys but i think this if they see me making noise and people are hitting them up saying like hey we need to have a wimbush way there you go that's the best way to make it happen so we need to make that happen let's these. make that happen i want yeah, it man. i want it to be like the next time we have wimbush over we have his the, protein on and the his, table his on the t- yes yeah. let's do it Let, we're gonna yeah. put it on instagram Tag them. Let's make that happen. Why not? I would. I would love to see that Absolutely. happen. You know what? We're we're manifesting that shit right now. We're manifesting it. It <laughs> is going to happen. We're gonna have the protein powder right here. Some creatine, maybe some amino acids. We'll have everything. Okay. We'll have the yeah, entire. If it line. happens, I'll I'll send you guys a gift package right away. If it happens, I like so. that. Go. We got Absolutely. it right here, man. Again, Official thank you sponsors. so so much. I'm looking forward to be sponsored by Windward yeah, Supplements. Maybe. Yeah, there you go. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. We're looking forward to see more stuff from you, and hopefully, we'll see you again sometime soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you guys on the next episode of Bad Decisions Coffee Break. Until Bye. next time, see you guys soon. Take care.